In the last video, we introduced uh, Coulomb's Law and uh, took a look at the electric force for a little bit. Um, now, at this point here, I need to give away the plot just a little bit and talk about a conundrum that uh, bothered Newton, actually, when he was developing his uh, theory of gravity, um, theory of universal gravitation. He um, decided that the when, say, two planets were interacting, he, he would say that the force of gravity was acting at a distance. Um, we, we usually say a, action at a distance. Um, this action at a distance, as time went on, it bothered more and more physicists. Um, somehow, in Newton's paradigm, uh, gravity, say, between the Earth and Jupiter, um, could the, the Earth could just, you know, somehow the Earth and Jupiter could just plain spontaneously interact despite the zillions of kilometers between them. Um, they seem to somehow directly influence each other. Um, and that got to be more and more troublesome. So giving away the plot a little bit, the resolution to this is that this is not actually how forces work. And this is also true with the electric force. Um, Coulomb's law would imply that the two charges interact directly, and this is not the case. In the early 20th century, with the development of the uh, theory of relativity, um, we found that space could be deformed. And if space can be deformed, what that means is that space is a thing. The problem is we don't know what the thing is. We've been working on that for over a century. It took us four centuries to figure out that it was a thing in the first place. So it cut us a little bit of slack, but it is a thing. <clears throat> and the way forces actually work is, say, in the case of the electric force, let's say I've got two charges here. I'll first put down, here's my charge Q1, and then I will think about inserting a charge Q2 at this location, but I don't want to draw it there just yet. So what happens is, Instead of, if I were to have a charge Q2 here, Q1 does not directly interact with Q2. Instead, what happens is this charge modifies space. How much space? All of it. Um, it changes a property, it, it changes certain properties of space in all of space. Now, it also turns out the memo um, of where Q1 is located, that only propagates out at the speed of light. Um, but for now, that isn't going to bother us because we'll keep all of our distances small. Then, once I put, ch so this point in space here gets modified and then what happens is when I put charge Q2 here, space itself interacts with this charge. So Q1 modifies this location in space and space itself mo interacts with this charge so that we have our force of charge one on charge two, but it's not directly charge one onto charge two. It's charge one modifies all of space, and the space right here where Q2 is, is what interacts with Q2. By the same token, this goes the other way around. Q2 modifies all of space around it, and it is space that is interacting with the charge to give us our, what we have been calling the force of charge two on charge one. Newton's third law is still respected. Um, these are still equal and opposite forces, but it turns out that the 
<clears throat> what these charges do is they modify space around them and then the space where the other charge is at is what interacts with that charge to provide the force. So we don't know exactly how space is being modified or what's going on deep down. I mean, if you hear people doing work on things like, for instance, string theory um, or axon theory or other things like that, um, these are attempts to describe the thing that is space. But even though we don't know what the thing is, we can start to talk about properties that space has at every location. And one of these properties is what we call the electric field. So this is a property um, at, a, um, at a specific location space. So say if I'm interested in that point right there, we can say the electric field, and yes, we use the symbol E again. So this isn't energy. This is the electric field, and this is a property of space. Um, at this location is what will interact with our charge. So if I go and stick a charge here, then the force that that charge will feel will be the charge I put there times the electric field at that location. And you've actually kind of seen this before, but I will get into this in a later video. Um, if you remember near the surface of the Earth, you wrote things like the force of gravity is equal to mg. That's because this g is not technically an acceleration. Even though a lot of books call it the acceleration due to gravity, it's actually the gravitational field strength. So again, it's the same deal. The mass was interacting with that location in space. So in a certain sense, what this electric field is telling me is how much force per unit charge space can exert on a charge that you choose to put at that location. Now, there's fields absolutely everywhere, but um, this is telling us what the force per charge is. And it also has to have a direction. So we'll start for now by defining the electric field through its effects, since we don't completely know what's going on with space anyway. So we will define the electric field at some specific location space. So I'll write x, y, z just to make that clear. We will define that. Remember, triple equal sign means by definition. What we imagine is that we imagine sticking a charge here. Now, this charge is just a totally hypothetical, made up, doesn't actually exist charge that we call a test charge. And sole purpose is to be divided back out. You'll see what I mean in a second here. So we say, okay, I stick some test charge at this location. Um, whoops. And I find the force that it feels at the location I put that test charge. And then I divide that test charge back out. So when we look at that, we realize the units of electric field are going to be Newtons per Coulomb. Um, if you go look up electric field strengths and tables and stuff like that, you'll often see them write volts per meter. We'll get to that. Um, they're the same thing. But this is, you can kind of think of this like, say, buying bananas. If you go to the store, you know, they'll tell you that the price of bananas is so much per pound. So that's actually not really... The price of bananas if you think about it because the price of bananas should be in dollars right and to say dollars per pound that's not the units of a price so to a physicist we would say that that what a store would call the price of bananas it's technically a price field um, if we say that it's so many dollars per pound um, what that means is you can take that price field times it by the number of pounds of bananas you buy, and that's the price of your bananas. 
you can think of an electric field as the same kind of thing. At every location, we have this vector. And it's saying, if you put a positive charge at that location, so let's just think it through here. So this is my location right here. And let's say I have a electric field vector here. Um, what this is saying is if I put a, char a charge at this location, the electric force that it feels, if I were to put a positive charge here, um, the electric force will be equal to Q times E. But since Q is positive, the electric force has to point in the same direction as the electric field. On the other hand, if I were to stick a negative charge at that location, the electric force would be in the opposite direction. And that would again, but you'd still just write Q times E. But now, because Q is a negative number, um, that means that F will point in the opposite direction of E, and the force will be anti parallel to the field. So the field is a vector. It isn't going from anywhere to anywhere. It is a vector that we associate with a position that gives us information about the direction. And then there's also a magnitude, which is just saying, you know, it's so many newtons per coulomb. So let's say if I put one coulomb of charge there, that's how many newtons of force you'll get. If you put half a, new, half a coulomb there, you get half that much um, force. And two coulombs, you get double that force and so forth. So again, it's sort of like a price. Where this comes in handy and why we want to bring it in so quickly is <clears throat> unlike gravity where we could draw maps of forces of things. Let's say I go and stick a positive source charge here. Um, the problem that we have is if we try to draw a map of forces. So let's say we go and put some positive charge anywhere. Well, if I'm far away, we see that the force will be relatively weak. If I'm closer, it will be stronger. If I'm even closer, it will be even stronger and so forth. But the problem is, is that you then kind of have to loop around and do it all again for, but what if the charge was negative? And you would then have to draw all these vectors that are anti-parallel um, at the same location, saying, you know, if I put a charge here, that's the force it would feel. And because we've got this uh, possibility that we could be either attracted or repelled depending on the charge um, that I put at that location. So we'll call these our test charges. Um, it makes for incredibly cluttered diagrams. And so if we go ahead and just draw the corresponding electric field map, well, the beauty of it is no matter what the test charge was, if I divide the test charge back out, here, if it's positive, the electric field would be pointing in the same direction. Here, the electric field points in the opposite direction of that force, which is still out. So if we draw an electric field map, I can go ahead and write in my source charge plus Q here. And then just at every location, I can draw an electric field strength. And so here they're all pointing outward. And what we can do is just realize that if I put a positive charge here, the force it would feel at this location would go outward. And if I put a negative charge here, it would go inward by F equals Q times E. So this takes care of the whole flippy floppy thing that you have if you have to keep saying, oh, but what if it's positive? Oh, but what if it's I put a negative charge there? This takes care of that all at once. And so although it's a deeper and more profound thing, because we're talking about a property of space itself, 
it's incredibly handy just to help think about things to not get cluttered. All right, so let's just work through finding the electric field for a point charge. So we've already been drawing the electric field maps for these things. Um, so again, let's just have, so we'll first think about what if my source charge is positive, and we'll see at the end that it doesn't matter here, but if it's positive, we've already worked out from before that the electric field strength will be greater if I'm closer, weaker if I'm farther away, and it'll point radially outward, and you can just draw arrows at all these different locations in space anywhere you want. Um, let's draw one over here just to help make that point. Um, so it'd be nice if we had some sort of nice convenient vector language to describe this, and we do. So just a quick reminder about the radial unit vector. Um, so let's say this is my point that I am at, and this is my point of interest. Um, the radial unit vector, r hat, is a vector of length one that points to the point of interest. So here, if I'm thinking about charge one, r hat would point that location one here, r hat would point that way. I'm thinking about this location, r hat points, whoops, that way, and so forth. If I'm thinking about this location here, r hat points that way. Um, it's always, ju it's just a vector of length one that points away or outward. Um, so we can write the elect so if I imagine sticking a test charge QT here and that's Q, we can write the um, electric force. Um, let's use the one over four pi epsilon naught form of this. So this would be one over four pi epsilon naught Q QT over R squared, where R is the distance from the source charge to the point of interest times r hat. Now let's see how that works. Since we're saying q is positive, this will be a positive number. If qt is positive, that's also a positive number. So positive times positive is positive. r squared is positive. These are positive numbers. So everything's positive. Um, and this is a vector of length one. So no units or anything to worry about. And it points away. So sure enough, this points away. Great. What if I had a negative test charge? Well, if we had a negative test charge, then we know it would attract, right? So we, we need to get towards somehow. Well, if Q is positive and QT is negative, these two and the times together will be negative. Everything else is a positive number. So I'll have negative away. Well, negative away is towards so sure enough, that encodes the towards. This also works if the source charge has the is negative, and we don't have to change the equation at all. So we already know if I put positive test charges around, we will be attracted towards my negative source charge now. So It'll be fairly weak here. It'll be quite strong there. It would be somewhat strong there, and so forth. And yes, these are more. These diagrams get more cluttered um, when everything's pointing towards, just because the arrows tend to start crossing on you. We will, as we go on, develop another way of writing these so that this arrow crossing thing doesn't become an issue. But here, where Q is negative, 
if I have a positive source charge, I should attract. Let's check that out. Q time is negative. Q test is positive. Negative time negative times positive is negative. All these numbers are positive. Negative times away is towards. Hey, great. And finally, what if I put a negative charge at these locations? We know it should repel. Well, negative times negative is positive, so positive times away is away. And sure enough, it goes out. So by writing it this way with this r hat, which is a mathematical way of writing away, um, we don't have to worry about taking care of directions by hand anymore. Um, it all gets taken care of by the plus and minus signs. So now with that, we can use our definition of electric field. Um, remember, by definition, the electric field at some location was equal to the electric force that a test charge felt with that test charge divided back out. So this will be 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught q q test over r squared r hat. And then we divide by q test. So cancel, cancel like that. And this should always happen. The test charge needs to cancel out because it's a purely mathematical concept. It's just literally for us to be able to hit. It's just like it's the more advanced version of making up a number. Since we don't know what this is and doesn't even need to have physically ever existed, it's just saying if I were to put some hypothetical charge at this location, this is what I would call it. This always needs to cancel out. So we are left with the electric field due to a point charge being 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught q over r squared times r hat. So does that match with what we were intuitively drawing? Yeah, it does. If I'm far away, r would be big, the field would be weak. Sure enough, that works. And if I'm close, the field is strong. If the charge, if the source charge is positive, there'll be positive times r hat, which means it points at every location. It'll point away from the source charge. And here, if it, Q is negative, it means negative times away, which is towards. Um, at every location, the electric field vector would point towards the source charge. Okay. In the next couple of video series, we will be doing more with the electric field, but this is just to kind of start to get you into trouble now. So with that, I will catch you in the next one.